Um, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, I thank you for being with us tonight. And I thank you for my brothers and sisters here with me. And Lord, I just thank you for healing and answered prayers. Just so grateful to be here tonight. And so, Father, be with us and bless us as we begin this uh, study of Amos tonight. We thank you for all of your goodness. Be with us, Lord, as we pray. Give us your Holy Spirit to help us to pray um, when we don't know how we ought to, which is every time we pray. And give us your Spirit, Father, who can open up your Word to us and teach us. The same Spirit that was with Amos is the same Spirit who's with us now. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. In Christ's name, amen. All right. So way back on January 5th, we did an introduction to Amos, which is on the uh, church website. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, but that same night, for those of you uh, uh, watching at home, because um, we've tripled our numbers now, uh, uh, I came down with COVID and it was the long COVID. And so for the first time in a month, uh, we are we are back and uh, just so grateful. So uh, I've made everybody in the room sit back a little bit, and I'm pretty sure that none of you can get the COVID computer virus from watching this Bible study. So, uh, so we're just glad you're here. So uh, tonight we're going to be looking at Amos verses one through ten, uh, chapter one verses one through ten, um, and Amos is one of my favorite uh, little books of the Bible, one of the the minor prophets towards the back of the Old Testament, uh, and for someone who. Uh, very pointedly says later on in the book that he is not a priest or prophet or uh, any such thing. Uh, he does a brilliant job of setting up this sermon. Um, Amos 1, right off the bat, tells us the date of his ministry. He says in verse 1, the words of Amos, who was among the shepherders from Tekoa, when he envisioned and visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Well, that places Amos clearly in the 8th century BC. Um, Jeroboam ruled about 783 BC to 745 BC, because in before Christ numbers, you're counting down. The comment about the earthquake doesn't help us too much in terms of dating it, except uh, that this earthquake is also mentioned in Zechariah 14, 5, chapter 14, verse 5, having taken place during the reign of King Uzziah, where the prophet says that when the final battle comes, people will flee as they did during the earthquake. So Amos is from the south. At this point, Israel is divided, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. If you are here in the room with me, and or if you're at home and you go uh, onto the church website and download tonight's notes, there's also this map uh, I've included uh, here on the back of your sheet <laughs> uh, to kind of help us. So you see uh, the, the kingdom of Israel is in the north. Uh, and it basically splits right there between uh, Jericho and Ai in the kingdom of Judah in the south. Um, Amos is from Tekoa, uh, which is in the south. Uh, so he travels north uh, to the kingdom of Israel, the northern Hebrew kingdom. Uh, and as you see on the map there, King Jeroboam built a sanctuary at Bethel. And it was probably at that sanctuary where he gave his first sermon uh, and begins his ministry. And so he launches out into the sermon. Now in verse 2, he begins by saying, The Lord roars from Zion. And from Jerusalem he utters his voice, and the shepherds' pasture grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. Uh, both in Joel chapter 3, verse 16, and Jeremiah 25, 30, we hear that the Lord speaks with a loud roar. Here Amos is setting the theme for his work. Uh, it's not about him. It's not he who is speaking, but God. He doesn't say that he's roaring, but the Lord is roaring. 
He is merely the mouthpiece for God. Now it says in that first verse that he was a shepherd. Now a lion's roar would send shudders down the spine of a shepherd. He's got to defend his sheep, defend his flock against a lion. Never an easy task. And so if you hear the lion roar, you're frightened, you're concerned, you're on the alert. And it is, it is exactly that fear of the Lord that Amos' message seeks to instill. Now the voice of God does not come from Bethel, where Jeroboam had built his temple, his sanctuary, but from Jerusalem, down south, the capital of the southern kingdom. And being from the south himself, Tekoa, there would be nowhere else that Amos would expect to hear the roar of the Lord. And so what does this mean? Well, whenever God speaks judgment, there's always a tangible demonstration of that judgment. And here, at the end of verse 2, the shepherd's pasture grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. The last two lines speak of drought. With no rain, the pasture dies, and there is no grass then for the sheep. And sheep require a lot of grass. And Carmel refers to Mount Carmel, which is in the north, which juts out into the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Mount Carmel had always been heavily overgrown with vegetation. And here, even all of that has dried up. So God roars, and his initial judgment comes in the form of a devastating drought. But then Amos kind of shifts a little bit as he's beginning this sermon. And if you think about him maybe being on the front steps of the sanctuary there in Bethel, very loudly he proclaims, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. So I will send fire upon the house of Haziel, and it will consume the citadels of Ben-Hadad. And I will also break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avon. And him who holds the scepter from Beth Eden, so the people of Aram will go exiled to Kerr, says the Lord. Well, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four. So Amos comes to the northern kingdom with a message of God's judgment, but he doesn't start there. Instead, he begins a long sermon of judgment against Israel's enemies. So tonight we're going to look at half of it, and next week we'll look at the other half. And this is what I was getting at when I said for someone who very pointedly declares that he is not a prophet or a son of a prophet. He's not a professional preacher. Later on, he, he says, you know, in addition to being a shepherd, he's a seasonal picker of sycamore figs. He understands a brilliant part of luring people in for a speech. Why? Because people always prefer to hear sermons about other people's sins rather than their own. So he starts with Damascus. Well, the implication right off the bat is that God is Lord of all. He is not just sovereign over Israel and Judah, but he is sovereign over the whole world. So he can condemn Damascus, the Syrians, for what they have done. And so he begins by condemning them. And by condemning Damascus and the nation of Syria, well, this would have instantly been a hit with the people and would have quickly gathered a crowd. Syria was Israel's strongest neighbor and biggest rival with a long history of bad blood between them. And he says for three transgressions and for four. Well, three transgressions in Jewish thought means enough. If you have three servings, you've had enough, full, complete. Four implies more than enough. And what he's saying here is that sin can build up cumulatively. 
When you start just stacking sin on top of sin, on top of sin, on top of sin, at some point, it becomes just too much. And the final straw seems to be what the Syrians did in Gilead. Now we sing the old hymn, there's a bomb in Gilead. What do you use a bomb for? You use a bomb to heal wounds, right? An ointment, a salve to put on something. Well, Gilead refers to a territory east of the Jordan between the Arnon and Yarmuk rivers. And the Hebrew word for threshed, that they threshed Gilead, the Hebrew word for threshed literally means to trample on. Now, various passages in the Old Testament show us that threshing was done by the feet of animals as they trampled out the grain. Uh, these days, you and I don't thresh much. Uh, even in uh, modern agriculture, we don't do a lot of manual threshing. But they needed something heavy to smash out the kernels of wheat. So the hooves of, of uh, large animals would be able to do that. But there were also other means of doing it as well. And it seems that when the Syrians attacked Gilead, they took heavy sleds that had jagged teeth on the bottom intending that was designed to be able to cut straw to pieces and to crush out the, the uh, bits and pieces of grain from the straw. And they used these sleds to be dragged over the bodies of the conquered people. Um, it was a means of torture and, and slow death for them. And so this is just a brutal, brutal, brutal way to be, even in those days. And so they threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. Uh, some translation says, uses the word sledge. Uh, it's a very, very heavy uh, piece of uh, iron that they would have dragged over the bodies of the people. So the result is that God is going to send fire on the house of Hazael. Uh, the house of Hazael refers to the family dynasty of Hazael, who were kings over Syria beginning in 842 B.C., the second king was Ben-Hadad, who came to the throne in 802 B.C., and we are introduced to him in 2 Kings chapter 8, verses 7 through 13. Fire then refers to the flames of war, suggesting that God's judgment on Damascus means that war will come to Damascus, and all the strongholds and palaces of the Hazael kings have built will be destroyed. The gate bar in verse 5 is the gate bar to the city gate. Avon, the valley of Avon and Beth Eden, refer to the places where the Syrians worship their sun gods. Uh, so he's going to destroy their royal power. He's going to destroy all their fortifications. And he's also going to destroy the temples and the high places where they would worship these pagan gods. And Amos ends the Syrian part of his sermon by saying that its people will be exiled to Kir, K-I-R, Kir. Uh, now, the whereabouts of Kir is unknown, but it was believed that Kir, wherever it is, was the place where the Syrian people had come from before settling in Damascus. So God's judgment includes sending the Syrians back to wherever it was they came from. Just moving them out altogether. Well, you can well imagine how this would go over with the people of Israel. Whoa, God's going to get rid of our strongest neighbor, our biggest rival. Oh, I like this preacher. Yeah, he's, he's going to get a good offering. And so he continues on in verse 6. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke his punishment because they deported an entire population to deliver it up to Edom. So I will send fire upon the wall of Gaza and it will consume her citadels. And I will also cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod and him who holds the scepter from Ascalon. I will even unleash my power upon Ekron and the remnant of the Philistines will perish, says the Lord God. 
Well, this couldn't be better news for all of the people there in Israel. God's going to wipe out the Philistines too. Well, we never liked them to start with. But what Amos does is he shifts his gaze. And again, if you look at your, your map on the back page there, uh, you see where Damascus is up in the top right-hand corner to the northwest. Gaza is down on the opposite end to the southeast uh, in Philistia. And, you, and there on the map and there also uh, in the listing, it lists the four cities of, of the Philistines. You have Gaza, you have Ashdod, you have Ascalon, and, and Ekron. Um, now, some of you, um, thinking about the story of David and Goliath, are wondering where Gath was. Well, be, be patient. We'll, we'll get to Gath. Um, you have to take the third bus and change. Never mind. Uh, so, he shifts his gaze from the northeast to the southwest to their old adversary, the Philistines. Now, the Philistines were a seafaring people who had settled on the coast near Egypt and had come from a place called Kaftor. And we're told this in Amos chapter 9, verse 7, which was likely what we now know as Crete. And so today, the word we know as Palestine is actually an English transliteration from the Hebrew word for Philistine. And you see that one of the cities there is Gaza. So Gaza was one of the five cities of the Philistines. Now, when the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses III, who reigned from 1175 to 1144 BC, drove the Philistines out of his territory, he created sort of a vassal state for them. Uh, he wanted to use them as mercenaries. He was a very smart fellow. Evidently, the Philistines gave his Egyptian army quite a battle, so part of the peace negotiation with them was that he would give them this territory that nobody else was going to challenge and that he would uh, use them as, as mercenaries. So he placed them in three coastal towns, Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ashdod. Later, the Philistines moved to the interior of the country and captured a city called Ekron and another one that we know from Goliath as Gath. Well, Gath isn't mentioned here. But it is mentioned in chapter 6, verse 2, where Amos implies that Gath, by this time, had already been destroyed. So there are four remaining cities of the original five Philistine cities. Gaza is called out here because it was the largest of the five cities. And as you know, the entire region these days is named for it. But, we, but it may have also been the most guilty of all the five cities. And here, the charge is not a war crime, but human trafficking. I will not revoke its punishment, says the middle of verse 6, because they deported an entire population to deliver it up to Edom. So they are charged by God with capturing an entire tribe of people. In, in the Old Testament, when they're speaking of an entire population, they mean an entire tribe of people and then selling them as slaves to the king of Edom. For punishment, fire meaning war, will come to Gaza and destroy her. And the same will come to Ashelon and Ekron until the last of the, 15th, last of the Philistines are destroyed. So if speaking judgment on Syria gathered the crowd, speaking judgment on the Philistines absolutely had the crowd cheering. Well, then we get to verse 9. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, for they delivered an entire population to Edom, and they did not remember the covenant a brotherhood. So I will set fire upon the wall of Tyre, and it will consume her citadels. So from Gaza in the southwest, Amos now looks north to Tyre, one of the most important cities of the ancient world. It's located on an island about a half a mile off the coast of Lebanon. The ancient Greek writer Herodotus says that Tyre was founded in the 28th century BC. That's a long time ago. 
Ancient writings from around the Mediterranean say that Tyre founded Tarshish, where Jonah had hoped to flee. That was the edge of the world. Tarshish was believed to be in Spain and that Tyre founded it somewhere around 1100 BC. They founded the great city of Carthage, who gave the Romans all kinds of problems. Uh, founded Carthage there on the North African coast about 700 BC. And the sailors of Tyre circumnavigated the entire continent of Africa around 600 BC, some 2,000 years before Vasco da Gama made the same journey. That's remarkable. I mean, when you think about the, the ships they were using, which were only about as long as this room and not as wide, uh, maybe one sail, nothing but star charts for navigation, and the further south you get, the less your charts are gonna do any good. And getting all the way around Cape Horn on the southern tip of Africa, right there within eyesight of the South Pole, seeing penguins in the water and, and, and orcas that are bigger than your ship. And they made it all the way around in 600 BC. All you gotta do is say, hey, they were good. <laughs> Just take your hat off to them. Uh, truly an amazing, amazing uh, people their entire. Well, their king, King Hiram, who was a contemporary of King Solomon, uh, built uh, a great harbor. Come in. Uh, a great harbor. Yeah, you got it. We have uh, seats available behind the stits there. Uh, 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 other than that, you got to sit in the balcony. You changed the date, the timing of the meeting? Six o'clock. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I'm just getting to the good part. You're just in time. Uh, so King Hiram was a contemporary of King Solomon. Uh, and if you remember, where, where did Solomon get all of his timber to build his temple? Lebanon. Yeah. So, so what did King Hiram do with all of his uh, money? Well, he built an amazing harbor and massive fortifications that withstood countless attacks uh, from the Assyrians, from the Hittites, from everybody. Nobody could touch them because they were half a mile off the coast uh, until Alexander the Great comes along. Now, Alexander, by the time he gets there, has already defeated the, uh, the Persians, uh, he's marched his way all the way from Greece to Turkey. Um, and I, I messed up. I didn't include the correct map this week. I have a map that'll be in next week's, I'm sorry. Uh, when we review, we'll have a look at it that shows what Alexander did. Bear in mind that Tyre sat on an island a half a mile off the coast. So when Alexander goes and says, would you very politely, nicely surrender your city to me because I love it just the way it is, uh, the king of Tyre says, uh, no, we have an impregnable city. You can't touch our city. I don't see much of a navy from you Greeks. And so, uh, no, go away. We don't want any Girl Scout cookies. And, you know, you just don't tell Alexander the Great that. There's a reason why he's called Alexander the Great. So he gets together with his generals back on the, the mainland, and they decide to build a causeway a half a mile long, 800 meters long. Um, and I, th I think it was like 30 meters wide, where he could take all of his siege weapons and all of his army and just march them right out there. Um, and, well, Tyre was built to defend itself against the Navy. It was not built to defend itself against land forces like that. And so they were able to sack the city and uh, destroy it. Did I mess up? I did, didn't I? Because I started at 6, and, and we're supposed to start at 6.30, aren't we? That's how long it's been since I've been here and what COVID has done to my brain. So for all of you coming in just now, 
My sincere, it is brain fog. I got to tell you, I have, I have not. I, yeah, you're absolutely right. Even my wife said, you've got to be there at six. Well, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Six o'clock. And I didn't argue at all. In fact, for the longest part of the day, I didn't realize it was Wednesday. Um, so Alexander sacks the city. Now, what was it that Amos said was going to happen? I will send fire upon the wall of Tyre and it will consume her citadels. When the battle was over, Alexander's chronicler says that there were 8,000 dead inside the city of Tyre. 2,000 by the sword, 6,000 he had executed by impaling them. Ouch. And what was their crime? Well, they, their crime was twofold. Number one, in the middle of verse nine, because they delivered up an entire population to Edom. Like Gaza, they were guilty of selling people into slavery. They took an entire tribe of people and sold them into slavery. So what did Alexander do once he sacked the city? He killed 8,000 and he sent 30,000 into slavery. Uh, one of the things that you see from beginning to end in the Old Testament, when God brings punishment on people, the punishment always matches the crime. The punishment always matches the crime. They were guilty of sending an entire tribe of people into slavery. And so 30,000 of them at Alexander's hand went into slavery 8,000 dead, all because the king of Tyre disrespected Alexander and refused to surrender the city. But remember also that here um, there was a second crime that they had, they did not remember, the end of verse 9, they did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. Um, so where does it leave us? 8,000 dead in Tyre, 30,000 sold into slavery. Uh, so to people who say the Bible never says anything against slavery has never read the Bible very closely, clearly. But, this, but just like Tyre, I mean, just like Gaza, they were guilty of selling people to the Edomites. But Tyre was more guilty, their sin more grievous because they broke the covenant of brotherhood, implying that they had betrayed a neighbor, uh, perhaps even a neighbor from Israel, and captured and sold them as slaves. So fire and war will come to Tyre and destroy her palace and fortresses. Now, Here's the thing that we need to remember. It didn't happen in Amos' time. It didn't happen in the next generation. It happened 400 years after Amos prophesied. Now, we live in a society where we want it that quick. Uh, I always love uh, uh, the comedian Stephen Wright. He is just so good at just real quick one-liners. And he said he took a cup of instant coffee and put it in the microwave and sent it back in time. You know, that's 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 what that's how we want it. I mean, we want instant coffee in a microwave, we want it hot, we want it right now. God's ways are not our ways, and brothers and sisters, God's time is not our time. If God says X is gonna happen, it's gonna happen, but it's gonna happen in God's time as a part of God's purpose. Uh last Sunday that my, you know, when I'm talking about uh uh, you know, one of my three points was was faith and how, you know, faith, faith is the, is the things we don't see. It's the things we hope for. It's this trust in God. Um, you know, so if, if, if Amos says that this is going to happen to Tyre and you look at Tyre out there on his island with its high fortifications, you're going, I don't. I don't see it. I don't see how it could happen. Well, not in your lifetime or your children's lifetime or your children's 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 lifetime. 400 years passed, but in the end, 
It went exactly the way that Amos said it was going to happen. Um, there were all kinds of problems in the second generation or towards the end of the first generation of disciples because Jesus didn't come back when everybody thought Jesus was supposed to come back. You know, why isn't Jesus back? You know, well, clearly this whole Christian message is wrong because Jesus ain't back yet. So how can I believe it if Jesus doesn't come back when I figured out when he should come back? You know, uh, as if it's up to us and that he has to fit our timetable. Um, today, well, it's been a long time since Jesus was here. Jesus said he was going to come back and it's been 2,000 years. I mean, my goodness, how long does it take? Yeah. Well, I don't know. How long did it take for the Hebrews to start looking for a Messiah? Well, it was over 2,000 years. Um, our view of time and our understanding of time and what's long and what's short is, it has nothing to do with God's understanding of time and how God views long and short. In fact, time, as far as God is concerned, is inconsequential. God doesn't live in time. Time is something that belongs to creation. How do we measure time in the first place? Well, how many days does it take for the earth to go around the sun? You know, how, how, many, how many days does it take for the moon to go through its cycles? I mean, you know, we, we look at things related to creation, the sun and the moon and the stars. And, and this is, you know, from what time, how long does it take for the sun to rise and the sun to set? This is how we base time. All of that has to do with creation. But where God sits is outside of all of that. Uh, God isn't bound by 24-hour periods or 12-month years or anything of the kind. If God says it's going to happen, it will happen. It may not happen when we think. It may be a lot longer. <laughs> it may be a lot faster. You know, But it's going to happen in God's way and in God's time. There is no doubt in my mind that God used the whole thing with the Babylonians to be able to work with, as he told um, Habakkuk, I'm using the Babylonians to make a correction with Israel. He used the Persians to punish the Babylonians for the things that they did. He used the Greeks to be able to take care of the Persians to punish them for what they did. And the Romans made the expansion of the gospel possible. Uh, without the Romans building their wonderful roads and having the Pax Romana where Paul could get on a boat and travel all around the Eastern Mediterranean without fear of pirates. You know who took care of the last of the pirates of the Mediterranean? Julius Caesar. He lured them all into a trap and when he captured them all, he crucified them all. He got rid of all the pirates. Uh, so that trade could happen all over the Mediterranean and the Romans could move about without any fear of attack. So that Paul could go from point A to point B anytime he wanted without hardly any fear of attack whatsoever. The Romans made that possible and God used all of that. And what we're going to find as we continue to go through this, particularly as we look at next week, is that even pagan countries are part of God's plan and that he is Lord of all, regardless of whether or not they honor and acknowledge him or not. Uh, yeah, that's, that's just the way it is. So even in our own day, in our own time, um, you know, the countries who acknowledge God are still under his judgment. Uh, and if you think about it, well, we've seen it just in the last hundred years, time and again. So we want to see God do everything on our timeline. But his ways are not our ways, and his time is not our time. But to hear such a judgment on Tyre, well, my goodness, he started out telling everyone that God was going to condemn Damascus and the Syrians and send them back where they came from. And then he was going to get the Philistines, and now he's going to get Tyre. What kind of response do you think the people of Israel are given to a sermon like this? Oh, my stars, they are dancing in the aisles. We like this preacher. I'll take up the offering, you know. So it's a long sermon. Next week, we're going to be able to get into the uh, uh, second half of the sermon. Um, and how it ends, um, um, it, it ends in two parts. He continues to preach about the other countries around Israel before he shifts his gaze uh, where he goes from preaching to meddling. Uh, and um, 
Uh, and at the end of, at, as, as he finishes the next few countries, uh, next week we're going to get down to chapter 2, verse 3. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to realize uh, that, you know, God's opinion is, look, you can believe in me or you don't. Um, I'm still God. I'm still the Lord of all. Uh, and you are still under my judgment. Uh, and, and honestly, that's, that's, that's the message of the whole Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament. Paul and Romans said, look, you know, yes, there are people out there that have never heard of Jesus, but they're still under God's judgment. Uh, they still know just by looking at God's creation what's right and what's wrong, and they will be absolutely judged for it. Um, okay. So that's, that's where we're going to end tonight at verse 10. Next week, we'll look at verses 11 through 15. And then down uh, to verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2. And we'll meet at 6.30. I am so sorry. That just blows my mind that, that I did that. Uh, but I'm telling you, that's, that's how long this has been. Even when I left the house today, I went out the wrong door. I'm going, this, this isn't good. So, anyhow. Um, so let's have a word of prayer and we'll have a look at our prayer list and see if I do better with that. Father, I thank you for being with us tonight. I thank you, Father, for um, uh, grace and mercy and, and forgiveness uh, of my brothers and sisters here for starting early. And Lord, I just pray that you'd be with us and, and open up your, your Holy Spirit to us so that you can give us insight and wisdom on what you're teaching us as Amos is preaching. But, but Father, as we pray now, Father, lay on our hearts um, all we need to in order to be able to pray as we should. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. In Christ's name, amen.